All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first meeting of Liberation Schools class on Volume 1 of Marxist Capital. My name is Marisa Sanchez, and I'm a member of the PSL. I'm currently based in New York City, and I'm a member of the collective, um, the editorial collective of Liberation School. And we are really excited to be offering this course to you and reading this book with you at this really critical moment in time. Capital is one of those books that for many of us, we want to read it, but it's either too intimidating to start, or if we do start, we can find it hard to push through. So what we want to be doing with this course is reading the book together, encouraging each other, and most importantly, considering how what we're learning about from the book can be applied to our own organizing, how it can inform our agitation and propaganda, how it can assist us in advancing the struggle for socialism. Um, because we know that we're not just studying for studying's sake, but really to be able to take what we learn out into the streets um, to help us organize. So with that, the current COVID-19 pandemic is intersecting with an intense economic crisis and as well as a you know, national uprising against racism. And despite what mainstream media pundits say, the economic crash isn't just the result of the pandemic. So in this course, we want to get at the roots of the crises by collectively studying this first volume of Marx's Capital titled A Critique of Political Economy. The book was originally published in 1867, but it remains a key resource for understanding the ins and outs of capitalism. And this is really because Marx wrote the book to provide a theoretical weapon in the hands of the working class and oppressed. And while the book is long and some parts are complicated, it's one that every worker can understand through careful reading and collective study. And so with that, to assist you in reading and to help foster discussion, the instructor, Derek, will be providing reading guides each week. And these reading guides obviously aren't exhaustive and we don't want to read in order to answer the guides. Um, they're just guides. So just like when you're on a tour and you don't confine your listening and looking just to what the tour guide is saying and pointing at, when you read the book, you should also be looking and listening to as much as you can. And really what we recommend you do is first read the guide questions, then uh, read the chapter, and then go back and answer the questions. But if while you're reading you need to reorient yourself, you can always look back at the guide. So with that, what I'd like to do is go ahead and introduce Comrade Derek Ford. Um, Derek is a teacher, a PSL member, and has been an organizer with the party in Baltimore, Syracuse, Philadelphia, and for the last few years has been organizing in Indianapolis. And he is currently serving as the editor of Liberation School. Um, Derek is a professor at a liberal art college where he teaches classes in philosophy and history within an education studies department. And for his work, he researches the relationship between education and political movements. And Derek's written or edited nine books, the latest being from 2019 and called Politics and Pedagogy in the Post-Truth Era, Insurgent Philosophy and Fee and Praxis. Um, so with that, please welcome Comrade Derek. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, welcome, comrades. Thanks so much for joining the class. Um, I'm really excited to study this book with you at this particular moment. Um, for class today, we'll talk about the, the prefaces and afterwards by uh, both Marx and Engels. But before we do that, I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the book, the structure, the flow of, I guess, both the book and, and the class. So I think obviously Capital can be a pretty intimidating book. It's a book that many people want to read, uh, many people try to read, and oftentimes don't complete it. Um, but it's a, it's a totally doable book if we just sort of like push through it. And most importantly, if we stick together, it's a book that, you know, you can read many times if you want to, 
And in this class, we're not going to be sort of exhaustively going over every single detail in the book or, you know, the, I mean, basically like endless debates about all those myriad details, but we'll really, you know, be focusing on what we as organizers and activists as communists advancing the class struggle, um, you know, the sort of key points that, that we want to uh, deploy. So, um, but you know, it's not just a dense or difficult book, it's also a really good book. It's, the, it's really the pinnacle of Marx's thought and it was really the publication of this book in 1867 that allowed us to talk about something like Marxism uh, as a comprehensive uh, theory, you know, a doctrine as a way of approaching and, and working and transforming the world. It's uh, the only volume, volume one is the only one that Marx published during his lifetime. Uh, Engels later put together volume two and uh, kind of stitched together volume three. Volume two is, is more or less complete. Volume three is a, a little sketchier. There's some places where the, the manuscript just sort of breaks off. And then Karl Kautsky also uh, later on put together uh, theories of surplus value, which is the, the fourth volume. But it's, you know, it's not just a book about political economy. It's also... I think where we see Marx's, Marx fully deploying historical materialism and dialectical materialism in a really um, comprehensive manner to look at capital as a totality. So it's, you know, he, he doesn't write about historical materialism or dialectical materialism in the book, but he, we can see those uh, sort of methods operating uh, in the text. And uh, we could see how they make sense and they, they explain so much. And so it's not just then a book about political economy, but it's also a book about philosophy, history. Um, and you, one of the key tenets of Marxism is that you can't really separate those things because anytime you look at political economy, you're doing so from a particular philosophical standpoint, a particular moment in history, and so on, right, and, and vice versa. Every time you look at philosophy, you're doing so from particular political and economic systems. But obviously in this class, we're not interested in capital as the you know, development of, of Marxist thought from an academic standpoint, but uh, what, we can, what we can use you know, and as, as organizers and as, as communists. In uh, 2016, in advance of our third party Congress, we uh, circulated a document that's now available on Liberation School, and we identified one of the primary obstacles facing the movement today as um, not, the, not the overthrow and dissolution of the Soviet Union and the historic setback of the world communist movement that followed for decades, but we said that, I mean, we said that the setbacks are more common than victories, right? And instead we said that, quote, the problem today is that the theory of revolutionary Marxism and the entire vision of workers' power has been discredited and isolated from the people's struggles. And one of the examples in the document of a setback for the, for the workers' movement is the, where the uh, bourgeois democratic revolutions is swept across Europe in 1848, 1849, in which Marx and Engels both participated in. And after the defeat, Marx was exiled from Germany to London and he didn't see a, a new revolutionary upsurge on the horizon. And so he undertook a prolonged study of political economy. And one of the results of that is, is a book that we're reading now. And so one of our principal tasks in the party is to turn the situation around and to reinvigorate the people's struggles with revolutionary Marxism, to popularize socialism and to depopularize capitalism. And that's really why we want to read Capital, right? So that we can better understand, analyze, explain, defend, and advance Marxism in the various struggles that we're engaged in as a party. We know that the masses of people are increasingly dissatisfied with capitalism and that socialism is more popular than it's been in, in most of our lifetimes, certainly in my lifetime. And so in light of this situation, we said that we need to give a definition to socialism, right? So the word socialism has become popular, but what does socialism actually mean? And we have to give definition to it, not just amongst the left, but the wider working class. This obviously doesn't mean that everybody needs to read Capital or even that every you know, activist or organizer does, but the, the more people that read and study the book, the more that we do this, 
it'll help us um, you know, really analyze, understand, and explain the, the core contradictions that are uh, creating the material situations against which we're struggling. Uh, it can also help us explain and analyze and understand and deploy um, the tactics and strategies to move forward. And it can also help us envision what it is that we're moving forward to. So we're, we're reading the first volume and the, um, the subtitle is The Process of Production of Capital. And as I said, this is the only one that, that Marx uh, finished writing before he died and, and he was able to live through several revisions of it. So this volume focuses on the production of capital. And one, that's, that's what we'll be looking at primarily. Volume two focuses on the realization of capital, so or the circulation of capital. So capital doesn't isn't just something that's produced; it has to be distributed, circulated, exchanged, consumed, and so on. And within um, both the production and the realization of capital, there's sort of different contradictions at play. And then when you look at capital as a totality, you see those contradictions and the way they relate to each other. Volume three is is kind of a synthesis of uh, production and realization. And that's also where Marx uh, gets into uh, rent in, in particular, uh, distinguishing rent, different kinds of rent and uh, rent from profit and uh, a few, you know, obviously a uh, credit also. So there's a, a few things to keep in mind when reading the book. The first is that because Marx is trying to critique capitalism in an objective fashion, and he's also speaking not just to, to workers and revolutionaries, but also to other people studying and working in political economy. He often takes capitalism sort of on its own terms. So he'll say that, um, you know, okay, so like in your ideal world, capitalism looks like, works like this. And then he'll show that how even in that ideal world, there's exploitation, oppression, right? And so, and crises. And so those things aren't you know, accidents, they're not, they're not bugs in capitalism, but they're features of capitalism. Um, and I mean, I think part of this, this is one reason maybe why the book can be a little bit tedious at times. Um, there's lots of equations at some, in some moments, and I encourage you just not to get bogged down in those unless they happen to interest you. Um, and really just keep reading and pushing through. One thing to note is that when you see a lot of equations, it's oftentimes Marx making a, a, a sort of uh, logical or theoretical proof rather than an empirical proof. So we'll see both of those in the book where Marx will like look at things that have actually happened in history and analyze it, draw lessons from it. And then we'll see other moments when he's looking at the, the sort of internal logic of something that's sort of abstracted from any actual historical uh, narrative, right? And so that, that it's, it's important to just sort of pay attention to, to what's happening. Another thing is that you should try to read the footnotes. Sometimes they're just Marx, you know, citing uh, people or, you know, including a bit more information. Sometimes they're, they're more substantial than that. So at the beginning of each week, I'm going to send you a, a study guide for the reading that we'll discuss the following week. And the main purpose of the reading guide is to help you not get bogged down in the details and really to guide you towards some of the more fundamental points that Marx makes, and in particular ones that will come up again later in the book. Because Marx introduces a lot of definitions and concepts early on in the book, and then he'll come back to them later. And when he comes back to them later, he'll oftentimes uh, add more to the definition. And he'll, he'll change it. He'll show how, well, this, this, this one thing that I said is actually like two things, right? Um, and so when you, when you encounter those later on by filling out the reading guides, you'll be able to sort of go back and say, okay, well, this is what it, it initially was. And then the, the other thing is that I guess that they're, they're just guides. And so it's like if you're, if you're on a tour, you don't just look at what the guide tells you to look at, you also look around and you find things that are interesting on your own. And so think about the guide as just that, as a guide, it's not as something that, you know, you have to like, uh, that, that dictates, you know, what you can look at and what you can't look at. I think that, I mean, the way that I would really recommend doing it is doing the reading and then filling out the study guide. And then if there's anything that you, you don't remember that's in the study guide, you can you know, go back to the text and find it. Um, another way it might be useful is if you're reading it and you uh, are sort of like 
you're wondering like what the point is or something like that, you can consult the study guide and it'll give you some things to be on the lookout for to serve as a, as a guidepost along your, your reading. Um, but also you should take notes on other things you think are significant, other questions that you have, things like that. And regarding the text, there's two major translations of the text. One is uh, an editions, one is International Publishers Edition, which was the original translation, and another is the, the Penguin Edition, which is a later translation. And the International Publishers Translation is the one that's on Marxist.org, where we have a link to on the, the homepage for this class. There are some important differences between the translations that are both literary, um, in other words, in terms of the sort of the way that the, you know, the concepts are expressed, the language that are used, but are, that are also political, uh, in particular, something that we'll address about halfway and mostly towards the end of the book, um, a, tra a trans translation difference between subjection and subsumption. But we'll, I mean, we'll talk about that more later and it does have actual like political significance. So I'm gonna be using the International Publishers Edition um, but if you have the Penguin edition or another edition, that's fine. As long as it's like the complete edition, you can't use an abridged version because that won't contain all the text because it's abridged. I'm gonna do my best on the uh, PowerPoints and during class to locate the page numbers for Penguin, the International Publishers Edition, and then the online edition because the online edition is the International Publishers Translation, but it doesn't have the same page numbers because it's just like a, basically like a Word document with the book in it. One thing is that the International Publishers Version actually has like, they have two different editions, same translation, but they have different page numbers. At the end, I think it's like maybe 30 or 40 pages difference. I'm not sure exactly what the difference is, but if, so if you have that, if you have the International Publishers Edition and it doesn't match the page numbers, uh, that's what's happening. And it gets sort of pro progressively different, uh, you know, the, the page differences as we go along, but it's never, it's never really too far off. Um, so this means that we'll be on different pages literally uh, in the class, but in general, the class will move sequentially through the chapters. So you can just sort of like follow along there. Another thing is to have the online edition pulled up on your computer so that you can do like a word search for the quotes or the concepts that we're discussing. Um, and I'll, I will apologize for my PowerPoints in advance. They are not uh, super snazzy or, uh, I don't know, graphically appealing. Um, sorry. Okay, so let me uh, share my screen with you now and I can show you just how unappealing they are. And we'll turn to the, the prefaces and that afterwards for the text. So the first is the preface to the English edition, uh, which is by Engels. And uh, this is on page 19 online. It is on page 13 in International Publishers, and it's on page 89 for Penguin. So um, Engels is saying basically the book was initially translated by one of Marx's comrades, uh, Moore, and then he couldn't do it, so they turned to Aveling, who was the, the husband of Marx's daughter, Jenny, or Eleanor. Uh, you, you'll notice that Engels and Marx are always apologizing for the difficulty of the text. Engels does that here, but um, but he, he says something significant, right? It's not just difficult. Um, he says there's one difficulty that we couldn't spare the reader, the use of certain terms in a sense different from what they have, not only in common life, but in ordinary political economy. But this was unavoidable. Every new aspect of a science involves a revolution in the technical terms of that science. Political economy has generally been content to take, just as they were, the terms of commercial and industrial life and to operate with them entirely failing to see that by so doing, it can find itself within the narrow circle of ideas expressed by those terms. So there's a couple things that are happening here, right? One is that Marx is, he's taking language that's in circulation, but he's redefining it and giving it, I mean, in some, some sense it's giving it an actual definition. Um, and then he'll also, that'll lead him to distinguish concepts and ideas from each other and then to develop new concepts for expressing the things that traditional political economy was missing. So in other words, like you'll see categories like profit um, or 
uh, credit, in the volume three, you'll see rent. And those are terms that, you know, in 1867 were common in political economy, but Marx is using them in a totally different way. Uh, and, and then he'll invent new, new terms as he's, as he's studying and critiquing political economy. And this is, um, you know, really consistent with historical materialism and dialectical materialism, right? That revolutions don't just invent new things out of thin air, but they, they come from working with and transforming the existing raw materials that, that we're working with. Uh, this is also where Engels uh, notes that the book is really widely read. It's been called the, the Bible of the working class. And we'll go next to the preface to the first German edition. This is by Marx. Um, and on the internet, it's page six. International Publishers is page 18. And Penguin is page 89. Uh, Every beginning is difficult, holds in all sciences. The value form, whose fully developed shape is the money form, is very elementary and simple. Nevertheless, the human mind has for more than 2,000 years sought in vain to get to the bottom of it all, whilst on the other hand, to the successful analysis of much more composite and complex forms, there has been at least an approximation. Why? Because the body as an organic whole is more easy of study than are the cells of that body. In the analysis of economic forms, moreover, neither microscopes nor chemical regions are of use. The force of abstraction must replace both. All right, so, so what is abstraction? I think when we usually hear that something is abstract, we might think that it means that something isn't really relevant or that it's like an academic argument instead of a political or maybe relevant argument. But Marx is, is using abstraction in a different way. Um, from, from Marx, generally what, what happens is you start with, with what's called the real concrete. So the world as it actually exists as a totality, where we find ourselves, right? Um, and it's, it's concrete because it's where all the forces of society are, are playing out, they're manifesting, all right, with all their contradictions. So it's something that we obviously can't just understand or grasp, right? Um, you can't just look around and really understand what's happening because you can't see the actual forces at play. You can just see their manifestations, the way that they appear, which is different than what's actually causing them to appear in a certain way. And so in order to think about it, we have to abstract to what's called the thought concrete. And this is basically like taking the real concrete, the world as it exists, and breaking it down into discrete units or concepts. Um, and then to think about like what they are, what they aren't, and most importantly, how they relate to each other. And at that point, then you return back to the real, the real concrete, which is now called the real concrete in thoughts, and you have a different understanding of it. Right? And it's the real concrete in thought because you haven't actually changed anything. You just changed the way that you're thinking about the real concrete and understanding it, right? And then also acting within it, moving it within it and transforming it. My guess is that there's ways in which you and I do this um, sort of, I don't know, maybe like instinctively or just, you know, we have some experience with it. If you think, for example, about like listening to a new song, you know, when you first listen to it, it's hard to make, it might be hard to make a judgment about the song or your judgment might change because there's just so much that's happening, right? And it's really because you haven't engaged in, in, in any abstraction. You're just at the real concrete and you haven't gone to the thought concrete yet. And as you listen to it repeatedly, you, you might engage in abstraction, right? You might isolate the lyrics at one point, the bass line at another point, the drums, right? The rhythm, the horns at other points. Um, and you might also be thinking about the structure of the song, how the verse, you know, the overall, the overall structure and then how the different components like the verse or the bridge or the chorus or whatever, the introduction, whatever, relate to each other. Um, and as you're doing this, though, you're not thinking about each thing in its isolation, right? You're thinking about it as it's relating to the other things. So, like, if you were to just take the bass out of a song, it's still the exact same bass but it sounds totally different than within the song, right? And the same thing if you were just take like, you know, four notes, you know, or like a, a measure of uh, the bass. And, you know, it's the same thing that appears in the, in the totality of the bass line for the song and in the totality of the song, but it's, it's something that's totally different than, than it appears within the, within the overall bass line and within the overall song. 
Um, and it, like, if you just listen to like a single note, right, it sounds very different than with the song because you're not just thinking about it in isolation. You're thinking about it in its relationship to other things. And the other things will change how the bass sounds, right? Its actual role within the song. Um, and so that's really, I mean, kind of what, what Marx is doing, right? Um, and the, the totality isn't just like a, a mechanical piling up or you know, calculation of all the discrete units. It's a living and dynamic assemblage. And the units themselves can be understood without thinking about these relations because the units are themselves part of those relations. So this is one reason why like your judgment on a song might change over time. You might like it at first, but then as you engage in abstraction, you realize that like there's actually not that much going on or vice versa. You might not like it at first, but the more you listen to it, the more you can appreciate it because you've, you've, um, you've engaged in the necessary abstractions and you've turned, returned to the real concrete in thought. So you have a new perspective on the totality and therefore you issue a new judgment. Um, so this is what Marx is doing, but it's, it's not just, the, the other difficulty is that Marx is within capitalism. We're within capitalism. So it's kind of like if you were on stage playing a song and trying to engage in abstraction also, right? Um, and also like you're improvising at the same time. So it's kind of like a bit unpredictable. Um, so it's like, yeah, so it's not just um, understanding the totality, but it's also something that's dynamic and living and that we are actually within. Um, an another point on this is that, you know, Marx isn't claiming that he is uncovering and explaining every single relevant concept or unit of capital as it actually exists in the world, right? It's not like a finalized definitive uh, picture of cap of the production of capital. That would, that would be impossible. And you'll see in the book, there's, off there's like a lot of times where Marx introduces something, a concept. Uh, he does it in, in volume one a lot with credit and he'll be like, yeah, there's also, we have to think about credit, which is like actually crucial. And when we think about credit, it kind of transforms everything, but I can't do that right now, right? I'm gonna do that later in the book or whatever, because it's impossible to write about everything within one book. So he has to make decisions about what abstractions he makes. It's really the necessary byproduct of any investigation, right? It's why you have to isolate some certain things. Um, and sort of discard, cast aside some other things. And so I think a lot of what oftentimes come across or are framed as critiques of Marx are really just people sort of adding in new abstractions into the totality, right? And they're not actually like contradicting Marx. Um, they're maybe like in, by introducing a new unit or a new, a new, a new concept or, or bit, they're changing our understanding of it, right? But not necessarily in a way that, you know, discredits or disproves what Marx is actually saying. And um, related to this, Marx tells us why he's looking at, at England, right? Um, the physicist either observes physical phenomena where they occur in their most typical form and most free from disturbing influence or wherever possible, he makes experiments under conditions that assure the occurrence of the phenomenon in its normality. In this work, I have to examine the capitalist mode of production and the conditions of production and exchange corresponding to that mode. Up to the present time, the classic ground is England. That is the reason why England is used as a, as a chief illustration in the development of my theoretical ideas. So the same way that phys the physicist isolates certain things, um, Marx can't study the totality as a whole, which is constantly moving anyway, so he has to make methodological choices. This is one of them, right? Um, and so as a result, there are historical limitations to it and historical specificities to it, right? as there are with any thought. Uh, he also notes, though, that even in England, where the capitalist mode of production is the most advanced at that time, there's still, the development is still incomplete, and there's still a whole series of inherited evils that oppress us, arising from the passive survival of antiquated modes of production, with their inevitable train of social and political anachronism. So in other words, even though capital is a totality and he's writing about it as a totality, it's not, um, it's not the only thing that there is. And there's other forms, modes of production that coexist 
at the time. And we're going to see that a lot throughout the book, where Marx is talking about how capitalism reacts upon previous modes of production, but how those modes of production and the relations that they entail continue to persist, although just in a, in a changed form. He also notes that he's treating individuals only insofar as they are personifications of economic categories, embodiments of particular class relations and class interests. So um, he says that you can't make the individual responsible for the relations whose creature the individual remains, right? However much the, the creature may subjectively raise themselves above it. So I think this is important. We're gonna see this a lot um, that, I mean, one, Marx isn't gonna make exceptions for like good natured capitalists or whatever. Um, two, obviously a capitalist is, you know, a person who is a capitalist is also a person and being a capitalist doesn't define them in their totality all the time, although it will like determine their operation within the mode of production, right? The, the structural position that they play. And then three, Marx is going to be spending a lot of time critiquing the notion of the individual who's atomized, who's in control of the situation uh, that they're in, who's determining it, and, um, and instead look at the fact that individuals are produced by society, right? They're produced, it doesn't mean that they're determined in every single way by society. Uh, economic systems shape us, they constrain us. But, you know, Marx is interested in, in changing the structure of society, not really individual people. And then by changing the structure of society, it's how you change uh, people. And, you know, I mean, some people will read this and read Marx's critiques of, of individualism and say, well, okay, so that means that a worker who you know, has a savings account acts like a capitalist because the savings account is accruing interest and that interest comes from you know, the exploitation of somebody else's labor. And I think that's, there are, there are ways in which like the transformation of pensions into 401ks has transformed people's consciousness um, and you know political perspectives uh but it's it's not um i think it's a question that we have to ask not in the abstract but in the concrete in terms of like okay what's the actual effect right does having a savings account um and accruing like 0.01 percent interest every year like what does that actually really mean okay so like yeah there's there's interest that's that, that means that there's a capitalist relation involved but also the worker is the product of those relations. And so it's not like, you know, it's a choice that can be made. And so um, that's important to keep in mind, right? He, I mean, he's not going easy on capitalists, but he's not, he, he's not dealing with individuals. He's dealing with, with structures and the systems that, that produce individuals. All right, the afterword to the second German edition, this is also Marx. And here he really gives a kind of a history of uh, political economy, uh, arguing that the political economy is a political project, right? It advances particular political aims. And bourgeois political economy, it serves to reinforce capitalism. And a real critique of political economy then uh, can only come from the class whose vacation in history is the overthrow of the capitalist mode of production and the final abolition of all classes, the proletariat. Um, and this is, you know, you can only really critique something if you understand that uh, it's not permanent and that there's, you know, sort of conflicts at play, right? And then you take up those conflicts. Okay. Um, he, he critiques Bastiat as a French economist and then John Stuart Mill. We're going to see a lot of that. He was a British philosopher and, and kind of economist, um, utilitarian. And uh, Bastiat was basically like a technocrat. Mill, he says, was trying to basically like reconcile irreconcilable theories like justice and, and capitalism or liberty or whatever. We're going to see a lot of uh, critiques of John Stuart Mill. Bastiat, um, Marx wrote about Bastiat in the, the last chapter to the Grindrissa notebooks from 1857, 1858, I think. Uh, they were published after 
after Marx's death in, the, in like, I think 1930. Um, but anyways, the, the working class has a particular vantage point to view capitalism, right? Because of our position, our structural position in society. Uh, later on, theorists will take this up uh, to develop something called feminist standpoint epistemology or standpoint theory. Uh, someone named Nancy Hartsock in the 1980s did this, located it within Marxist capital actually. And the idea isn't that, um, that one's standpoint within society presents like an unobstructed view or a perfect view of it, but that there are certain things that one might be more apt to understand and appreciate basically instinctively, right? So workers might understand uh, or see exploitation even if they can't name it or really, or, or think that it's wrong, right? Um, and the capitalists might not see exploitation even though um, they're the ones who are doing the exploiting. Okay, and then he talks about presentation versus inquiry. And let, let's read this. So, of course, the method of presentation must, must, must differ in form from that of inquiry. The latter has to appropriate the material in detail to analyze its different forms of the development to trace out their interconnection. Only after this work is done can the actual movement be adequately described. If this is done successfully, if the life of the subject matter is ideally reflected as in a mirror, then it may appear as if we had before us a mere a priori construction. So when you're actually investigating something, right, it's really messy, it's not linear, um, it's kind of like being in a maze. And then when you present something, you don't present it like exactly how you investigated it, you, you, change, you change it, right? So the presentation will look like, this was sort of like a natural thing, right? That, okay, so you're looking at the real concrete and then here are the thought, uh, here's a thought concrete, the units of the thought concrete that you sort of automatically come to, but that's not the case at all. Um, and this is also a reason I think why the beginning of the book is a little bit more difficult is because we're, you know, Marx is laying out a lot of definitions and concepts in the abstract. And then later on, he'll sort of build on those to give us the real concrete in thought. So once we're thinking about the, once we have all these discrete units and we think about the totality, right, it becomes easier to think about. But the beginning, it's a bit abstract. And this is where he talks about his dialectical method versus Hegel's. Um, he says it's not just different, but it's the direct opposite. So to Hegel, the life process of the human brain, i.e. the process of thinking, under the name of the idea, he even transforms into an independent subject is the demiurgos of the real world, and the real world is only the external phenomenal form of the idea. The demiurgos is like a mythical creature that shapes reality, basically. And so Hegel's method, Hegel's dialectic is like that the ideals shape the universe, right? And so we can see why this would be used to justify the present state of things because the present state of things is a result of our thinking. And so therefore, um, it's like, it's sort of, it's the way that it must be, right? And you can look at history as a sort of like progressive development of the unfolding of the perfecting of the mind based on, uh, in order to shape material. But with Marx's dialectic, the mind itself is in a dialectical relationship with the material world, right? So, you know, Marx wasn't, um, wasn't either a pure idealist or a pure materialist, but viewed them both as, as dialectically interrelated, right? Um, the material world shapes our ideas, but our ideas can also work to shape the material world, right? I mean, not automatically, obviously, there it requires political organization and a great deal of force and political struggle, but, um, you know, the material conditions of a time uh, set limits on thought, and thought can obviously work to push beyond those limits. But uh, nonetheless, there's a there's a dialectical relationship between the two, and then because the dialectic entails negation, um, it he'll said he'll he says that it's a scandal to the existing order of things, right? To bourgeois political economy because it locates things as, as changing and 
uh, through negation, which is the sort of overturning of something and then the construction of something new, again, not out of thin air, but the conditions of the process itself becomes a scandal, right? And that's, that's what's really critical about it, is that it's, it's locating the contradictions, the sort of seeds uh, within the present that might be seized upon to construct a radically different, a negated future. And there's a couple of other afterwards and um, uh, prefaces. Uh, there's the French edition where Marx, there's a kind of a famous quote, Marx says that there's no royal road to science. Um, and that, I mean, this is because the French edition was published as like a serial, so it wasn't published like as one book, but you know, periodically. Um, so he's talking about like, they need to be patient basically. And then there's the fourth German edition where Engels is, uh, it's really long, he's basically just, defending Marx's use of quotations against this guy who he calls our little Cambridge man, uh, Sedley Taylor, who took issue with, with Marx's use of quotations. Um, and Engels is basically like, you know, there's two ways that Marx quotes people or, um, or documents or sources. One is to just sort of like give evidence of something. And then another is to, to critique something, right? So here's what the bourgeois political economists say, here's what they're missing, here's why it's contradictory, and so on and so forth. So let's um, go ahead and end there. We can have a discussion period. And for next week, we'll be discussing chapter one, and I'll be sending out the reading guide um, today. So thanks, comments.